All right, guys, Murph's here, and today we're going to talk about this. A Ruger Speed 6. Now, before we talk about this particular revolver, let's go ahead and talk about the six series of revolvers and their origin. So, in the 1960s, Ruger decided that they wanted to get, this, they wanted to get in on a slice of the combat revolver market. Now, they'd already had a lot of success with single-action guns, uh, burning up that market, really taking a chunk out of Colt's pocket. So they decided they wanted to take an eye on police-type contracts for police-style revolvers. And they wanted to apply their investment casting process to it. Now, for a lot of people, when I say cast products, they probably, and, and firearms, casting and firearms, they probably think of like Century Arms and a lot of the issues that they have with like the RAS-47 and the cast trunnions and guns potentially exploding on the range and that might make them kind of balk at Ruger as a company because they're entirely built on investment casting their parts. However, Ruger as a company is entirely built on investment casting and have been doing it for 70 years. And they've been doing it really well. They've not had near the issues that Century Arms has had. So when you hear investment casting in this case, don't think of it as low quality parts. Think of it as cost savvy production for a still very high quality gun. This did not make it to where it is today by being poorly manufactured. All right, Ruger did not make it to where they are today by being poorly manufactured. No matter my opinion about the current state of Ruger as a company, this firearm typifies a completely different era in Ruger manufacturing. All right, so 1968, they started developing their own combat revolver. 1971, they had more or less what it was going to look at, and by 1972, it was on the market. And that was the Ruger Security 6. Now, the Security 6 was a 4- or 6-inch barreled blued revolver with adjustable sights and a squared butt. The original Security 6 had a slightly different grip angle to what you see here. Uh, the idea being that they wanted to kind of channel the high standard Sentinel 22 revolver. I'll go ahead and... Uh, put a picture into that here. And it's actually because one of the designers of the Security 6 came off of that project. Now that was a great target pistol setup for a 22, but for a combat Magnum, it actually made follow-up shots a little bit more of a recovery process. So they eventually went away from that to a more traditional curvature of the butt. Now that would be found on the 150 prefix serial number Ruger Security 6s and that would be a very early production. By the 151 you no longer see that grip angle. So if you have a grip angle that looks different than this one on a Ruger Revolt, on a Ruger Security 6, you've got yourself a fairly collectible firearm right there and you should be pretty happy with yourself. Now by 1975, due to requests from a couple of different customers, Ruger introduced two more models in the 6 series, and that would be the Service 6, which is generally a 2 and 3 quarter inch barreled stainless but can be blued fixed sight round butt revolver. Uh, I have heard of 3 inch models out being out there as well. And then also the Speed 6, which is a 4-inch barreled stainless steel round butt adjustable sight or apparently fixed sight, according to Ruger, revolver. Now, you might notice that I'm, I'm being a little wishy-washy on uh, combination of features. And that is because, guys, I've seen a ton of contradictory information. I've read magazine articles that indicate a lot of different barrel length and sight combinations, so I decided I would go ahead and contact... Ruger on this matter and try to get the the ominous ominous actual answer on this and then they gave me information that was even more different than things that I knew to be true. So what I can tell you for sure is that I have seen four and six inch barreled blued security sixes and they did or at least I'm pretty sure they did not produce it in stainless. I have seen two and three quarter inch and three inch service sixes and only ever seen them with fixed sights. And then I've only ever seen speed sixes in a four inch and a three inch with adjustable sights. Now, if you have a combination that's different than anything I just listed, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear about it. I'm actually, I'm extremely interested at this point because I didn't realize there was this much kind of difference across these models until I started doing research for this video. Now, 
This gun actually got a lot of contracts. It got picked up by INS and Border Patrol and the Coast Guard. There was also a contract made for the Canadian and British police units in chambered in 38200. And these you can recognize because they'll have a lanyard loop on the butt. That would be super cool. I'd actually be really interested to see a 38 Smith & Wesson uh, Ruger Speed 6. That would, that would definitely get my attention. The Service 6 was actually picked up by United States military for use by air crews. So that's pretty cool as well. Now, there were also a couple of departments that requested specific calibers. So there are models of these out there in 38 Special and 9mm, which I would absolutely love to get my hands on a 9mm uh, Ruger 6 Series revolver. That would be super cool. Um, just from a you know collector standpoint, not that I need another revolver, but I definitely would probably not be able to say no, especially if the price was right. And 1.5 million of these guns were produced until they discontinued production in 1988 so that they could start producing the Ruger GP100. That's a lot of revolvers. There's a ton of these out on the market and they're really, really good guns. So let's go ahead and talk about this revolver in particular. So. Up top, I have a large, originally blacked out front sight, which I have come back over with some red nail polish to go ahead and make it stand out a little bit more. The front sight is serrated to help break up glare, and the top of the barrel is also serrated to, again, reduce glare. As I mentioned before, this has a four inch barrel. And if you look here, this actually has a safety warning to make sure that you read the manual and all that kind of stuff. The 150 prefix revolvers will not have this on there. So once again, if you've got that kind of different uh, butt angle to the gun and no safety warning on it, you've got yourself a pretty rare Ruger revolver. Now you'll see that we have an, a half lug underneath, which is actually part of our lockup system for this revolver. This is a medium frame 33 ounce gun, uh, pretty much looking to compete with something like a Smith & Wesson Model 19 on the police market. We have an adjustable for elevation and windage rear sight, which somebody has come through, the previous owner, because I got this at a gun show, came through and hit this with a little bit of white paint to again make that rear sight stand out. I hate black on black sights, so I really appreciate that somebody did that. We have a swing out cylinder with a free float ejector. This revolver is chambered in 357 Magnum, which means that it'll also shoot 38 Special and can hold six rounds. We have a push button type release, which uh, is pretty fantastic if you're used to running like Smith & Wesson revolvers and that kind of stuff, because you push forward on Smith & Wessons as opposed to pull back on Colts. So this is very natural to be able to transition between Smith & Wessons and Ruger's. This rotates counterclockwise, uh, which is important to know if you're ever putting less than six rounds in the gun or you need to know where your live one is. Now what was really groundbreaking about this particular revolver was this section here. This actually, for disassembly, pops out entirely, which is just absolutely groundbreaking from a revolver standpoint because everything up until this point had lock plates on the side with a whole bunch of screws that held them in. You would unscrew it and then you'd do all of your work through the side of the revolver to be able to clean it in extreme cases or perhaps replace broken springs or maybe do trigger jobs. On this, you just drop it out like a lower and then you have access to all the parts that you need to make changes to. That's really cool. That's, that's an extremely savvy design on Ruger's part and it definitely made them stand out in the market. Now this is a double action Single action revolver, typical of a combat revolver for the time. The hammer is checkered for a nice positive grip. We do have the Speed 6 round butt, of course, and then these actually really charming wood grips with Ruger medallions and some press checkering. This is 
I really, I really love these grips, uh, like a lot. They're, they're very tasteful. They're very well done. This one has some, some nicks and a little bit of damage, but they are very charming, very warm. Um, some of these revolvers did come with Packmeyer grips, I think in a little bit later in the production series, and I hate them. I hate Packmeyer grips. And this just, this looks nice. I like this. We should keep this. All right, so what is my own personal history with this gun? Well, I've been shooting Ruger Speed 6s since I was very young. Actually, the first gun that I ever had for self-defense was a Ruger Speed 6. I was on a road trip with my dad. We stopped off at a gas station. He had to go in. We had a whole bunch of like really expensive stuff in the bed of the truck. So he handed me this and sternly informed me that my first round would go up in the air. So this is actually, I was like 14, I think I said, and this was the first gun that I was ever charged with using for self-defense. Not this one specifically, but a Ruger Speed 6. So that kind of started my, that, that got me where I am today. That started my whole thought process, or started getting me really thinking about like self-defense and application and all that kind of stuff. A Ruger Speed 6 did it. Now this gun in particular, I actually traded a Glock 27 for it at a gun show a couple years ago. Um, apparently, it had been sitting in some old lady's desk drawer for a couple of years after her husband had passed away, and she decided that she just couldn't she couldn't handle this. She needed to get rid of, rid of it, and uh, I traded the Glock 27 for it. And uh, I've been extremely happy with it. I've shot this a lot. Uh, this actually showed up in my bedside guns video, which if you haven't seen that, I'll, I'll put the link in the description, where it did sit on my bedside for a little bit. It has been a truck gun for me, and I've taken it hunting and stuff like that. Presently, it sits elsewhere in my home defense strategy, but for the most part, that's pretty much where it, where it sits. Uh, range, fun gun, and then also it's part of my home defense array. Now... What do I think this is actually a good use for this gun? Do I think it's a good home defense gun? I don't, and that's purely based on not having a, a rail for a light. I would prefer to have some means of being able to identify the target or fight in the dark on the gun. It's pretty difficult to get night sights for this and you can't put a light on it at all, so it's a little limited in that category. You can make it work, it's just, it's not the ideal. I would not recommend this for self-defense, like concealed carry. It's entirely too large unless you're doing open carry, and I really don't advocate for open carry. Now, I have carried this while hunting because a 357 Magnum revolver for wounded game or perhaps an aggressive animal would still be a pretty fantastic choice, and I would advocate for that. But when it comes to hiking, for uh, if you're concerned about dangerous game somewhere, I would not recommend this gun because 33 ounces is a lot. Now, I have taken this on a hike, and it was a pretty short haul. I, I didn't really have an issue with it, but I could see that if I was carrying this day in and day out, first off, I would want to invest into a very nice holster, maybe like a chest rig of some sort, but this is a lot of like food or water I could be carrying instead, just to, to frame that overall discussion. Now, I think this would have been... In the 1960s and 70s, this would have been a fantastic combat revolver. And I would actually, I would have most definitely thought long and hard about this amongst its contemporaries and competitors. And the weight doesn't bother me as much there because it does help absorb the recoil. And I would have a duty belt to take a lot of that weight and I'd only be wearing it for a shift. Now it'd be a long shift, but I would also have a lot of time without the gun on my hip pulling down on me and a, a well-designed duty belt to help take up that weight. So just keep that in mind. It's not the 60s or 70s. This may not be the best choice for duty type use. But if you want to talk about range fun, you put some 38 special in this, it is extremely fun to shoot. I'll actually, let's talk about shooting this thing overall. Now in 357 Magnum, it can be a little sharp, especially if you put some extremely heavy loads in it some of the, the hotter end of the spectrum for 357 Magnum, this gun can be a little bit to hang on to. However, 38 Specials are fantastic out of it. It is very easy to shoot. It's very enjoyable to shoot. And kind of more moderately loaded 357 Magnum, also completely viable options for this gun. Now, I have taken this gun 
to a course. Now that might surprise some people. So it's really hard to incorporate revolvers into most shooting courses because most shooting courses dictate that you bring semi-autos, you know, so that they can do malfunction drills and all that kind of stuff. They don't, their packing list kind of precludes the use of revolvers. Now I was going for some private rifle instruction from a local instructor that I, I trust quite a bit and decided that I would also bring this revolver along since the primary emphasis would be on the rifle. So I had this in a leather holster on my hip right below my plate carrier with magazine pouches full of AR mags and my, my go-to AR-15 all ready to go. I was, I was quite a sight. I was very strange looking. However, when it came to doing rifle transitions and all that kind of stuff and moving over to this pistol, it was just like any other semi-auto. All the fundamentals still applied. There was just more double action trigger pull involved. Now, let's go ahead and let's roll on some shooting footage of this gun out on the range. We can talk about its accuracy. Overall, this revolver is capable. It, whatever you bring to the table, it will match you for. Like I say with most guns, the vast majority of firearms on the market outshoot me. It's not a question of what the gun can do, it's a question of what I can do. Now, having said that, running a revolver effectively does take a lot of training and a lot of effort. And I'm really glad that I got to take it out onto that particular range trip and work with somebody and actually have to go through the management process of running a revolver in a, in a tactical type sense. But I think, I think for the most part guys, that pretty much captures my thoughts on this particular gun. So, Hey, let me know if you've got a combination of Ruger Security 6 that I didn't mention before, and uh, have a good day.